So I'm sure that when a lot of people think about synthetic biology, the first thing that comes to mind is something much more complicated, like say a system that causes a bacteria to convert glucose into jet fuel or something like that. But where it actually really started was just proving the idea that somebody could design and construct a synthetic network that will perform a function. Uh, it's very similar to how somebody can design a circuit that will perform, say, integration or differentiation. Uh, it just had to be proved that this can be done in a synthetic biology, uh, actually a gene network type system. And so the f one of the first examples that this could be done was with something called a repressilator. And I know it sounds like a some sort of terrible sci-fi weapon, but what it actually was was just a uh, oscillating system in which green, fl green fluorescent protein was the output, basically telling you what state the system was in. Um, so I'm going to scroll down and just give you some more basics about oscillators. So this particular oscillator worked uh, with a series of inverters and I'm going to denote an inverter as this little sideways triangle um, and this one actually worked with a cascade of three inverters put into series so just like how you can have different elements or components of a circuit in series in order to perform a function altogether um, this system worked by putting three different inverting or inhibiting uh, factors together in series um, and this actually output connects back over here and so the whole system follows the ar arrows um, and the inverter works by taking whatever input it gets and going one minus the input and say that to note the input this little squiggle so say if I start with a say I start with a, a one here well this inverter is going to go one minus one and it's going to output a zero that zero is going to cascade down to the following inverter which is going to go one minus zero and I'm going to get a one and then one minus one is zero and then so that zero follows back around here and then gets input back to the first inverter and so the second time around I'm starting with a zero I have one minus zero is going to give me one and then one minus one is going to give me zero and then one minus zero is one and you can see how this system will oscillate back and forth between zeros and ones so if I had an output of the system over here say output that would tell me the state whether I was at state one or state zero and in the case above what they used was something called GFP G -F -P. and what that stands for is green fluorescent protein and it's a tag that's used uniformly throughout synthetic biology as a means of finding out the state of the system or whether some protein is being exported from the cell. So it's something that you'll run into a lot. Um, it's actually a really interesting construct and I'm sure we'll get into it later. But this system in particular worked uh, it, by putting the inverters together onto a plasmid. So this here is a plasmid uh, that would then be transformed into say E. coli or yeast. In this case they used E. coli. And then they have another reporter plasmid, which is basically just the GFP. You see it's denoted here, GFP, with some sort of other tag over here. Um, and these elements that are before the actual coding sequence are uh, called promoters. So you can see each of these coding sequences has a promoter. And what actually happens is that the product, or what's actually coded, say here is TET R, um, inhibits another one of the promoters ca causing the associated gene to not be processed and there's no protein output then. So in the case of this system uh, TET R inhibits the Lambda CI network. So TET R comes over here and if oops, let me just undo that really quick and if TET R is present, then what it actually does is it binds to this uh, promoter site here, causing the DNA polymerase to not be able to come around and actually code for this sequence. So in the presence of TET R, Lambda CI does not get coded for. But if Lambda CI was present, it would come and it would actually inhibit the LAC I or it would act on the lambda PR network over here. And I'm denoting inhibition by a line with a, with a perpendicular line at the end, um, and that's a notation that you'll see throughout. 
and the lac i will inhibit the tet r production by working on this promoter over here and tet r is actually this part of the system this part the output uh, telling you what state the system is at so it works on this and you'll notice that these the pl tet01 and pl tet01 are the same promoters and they're acted on by the same protein um, and if pl tet01 is inhibited then gfp is not produced and so it's a lot easier to think about this in terms of zeros and ones again so say i have one i have tet r in my system or in my cell um, gfp is not going to be expressed so i'm going to have say a zero output or one in this case denotes the fact that gfp is not being expressed so i have tet r in my system that inhibits this lambda ci production and if lambda ci is being inhibited it's not produced which means that this inhibition you can follow the line over here uh, does not bind to the lambda pr which means that lac i can be produced so in the presence of lac i so this is at a zero and lac i is at a one so lac i is present in the system and it comes around here and it re represses the production of tet r so this then switches to a zero and so when tet r is absent from the system gfp can be produced and so we'll denote gfp expression as zero and what this actually looks like it's a green fluorescent protein so the whole cell actually glows green and then fades away and in this particular study it was shown that the oscillation so you can imagine this would oscillate back and forth throughout time so say if i have axes here those are terrible axes but and this is fluorescence fluorescence uh, this is high fluorescence and this is low fluorescence and this is time what would actually happen is the fluorescence would increase and then decrease increase and decrease and oscillate over time something basically to this effect and so the period that they found for this oscillation was actually about 160 minutes so you probably know period as the distance between two similar points on a wave so this is 160 minutes and what's interesting to note is that the average time for uh, the cell division is actually less than this so it's not only proving that you can create uh, and design a synthetic network such as this that will perform a function but it's showing that the state of the function, whether we're at zero or one, is actually carried over to the next generation. So similar how epigenetics work in humans, uh, that is the phosphorylation of our genes gets passed on to our ancestors, or to our descendants. Um, in the cell network, the state of the system was able to be passed on and continue this oscillatory cycle uh, to some extent.